Good evening, citizens of Portsmouth and members of council. I will now call our public work session to order. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the roll call? Yes, sir. Mr. Barnes? Yes. Mr. Battle? Here. Mrs. Lucas Burke? Here. Mr. Moody? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Here. Mr. Woodard? Here. Mayor Glover? Here. Ms. Jones? Ms. Sherry Neal is presenting the city's draft suggested 2022 state and federal initiatives. <laughs> Included in this presentation is an update regarding the outcomes of the city's 2021 state and federal legislative initiatives. Uh, in the interest of time, I've asked Ms. Neal to provide the inf this information to you, but not elaborate on the individual items. If time permits, we can always circle back to provide additional information if requested. Also, as you would note in her presentation, this being an election year, we have a very short turnaround time for having our meeting with our General Assembly delegation, acquiring sponsors, and having our items pre-filed. So we need to move along uh, with this process. Thank you, Ms. Neal. Uh, good evening. Thank you. City Manager Jones, good evening, Mayor Glover, Vice Mayor Barnes, Member Council. It's my pleasure this evening to be before you to present to you the 2022 suggested state and federal legislative initiatives. Included in this presentation, as uh, the City Manager just mentioned, uh, you have information about the outcomes of our 2021 legislative package. I'm just going to briefly touch on those. I'm not going to elaborate on anything. And then we will go to the 2022 uh, suggested initiatives. We'll um, also include some of the statewide public policy initiatives that uh, we are suggesting that we support. There's a, a list of important dates which will guide our next steps. And then finally, there'll be some questions and answers. So you may recall for the 2021 session due to the pandemic, uh, things were a little bit crazy at the General Assembly. We weren't quite sure how things were going to be handled, so we, we pared down our requests significantly to one legislative request and two budget requests. And I'm here to say that with the help of our General Assembly delegation, we were successful with all three items. Moving forward in the interest of time to the federal legislative initiatives. We also had spoken about following, not asking for anything in specific, but to continue to work with the National League of Cities and uh, advocating for the initiatives that they were advocating for. In doing so, we were very successful in getting the first time ever amount of funding sent from the federal government directly to a local government through the ARPA 22, 2021 funds, where the city is going to receive about <clears throat> 56 million over the two years in two tranches is going to be divided to, plus the ESSER money that went straight to the school divisions, which is about $46 million over two years. Also, for my working with the uh, National League of Cities Transportation and Infrastructure Advisory, Federal Advisory Committee, we learned early on about a window of opportunity for earmarks. And so we jumped on that opportunity through Congressman Scott's office. We did put in a request for <clears throat> the initial inventory and programming for revised lead and copper rule for about 500,000. And we were successful amongst the numbers of people who submitted a request for funding for earmark to have our earmarks moved ahead by Congressman Scott's office. However, because Congress moves at a stale snail space, <laughs> we're still waiting to see the outcome of that particular uh, request. Okay, moving forward to the 2022. The first issue is going to be the Midtown Downtown Tunnels issue. And I know this is something that has been near and dear to our hearts for a long time. Um, and right now, the state has, is flushed with cash uh, through the, not only the ARPA, but the general fund. It's looking really, really healthy. And we think that this is the time for us to try to make sure that we get either a significant permanent reduction or total elimination of the tolls. So we're going to be advocating for that. Uh, the next item is the two charter changes that council has requested. 
that you have already had your public hearings for and you've passed resolutions on. So that's included in the package. The third one is for increasing the Port Host Communities Revitalization Fund. This is something that was championed by the City of Portsmouth initially. We were very successful in getting this program up and running. We've been, we received about a uh, million dollars over the last two years for a revitalization of properties that's going to help um, take down derelict structures and put them back on the market for industrialized use to increase our tax basis. And uh, so we have been a asking for these increases every year. We've been lucky to get some increases. What we're asking for now is the Industrial Revitalization Fund, which is the big fund. Our fund is a sub-fund of that fund. The General Assembly, when they met for Special Session 2, they put $22.5 million into that pot. Uh, the word is that in the governor's budget, they're going to put another $22.5 in that pot. But that is not our pot. So we're asking that even though we may have access to the larger pot because we've never been able to get anything from them before because the pot was so small, we still feel that they should increase our pot to at least $5 million. So that's what's uh, the request there. And the final request is for the Emergency Shelters Upgrade Assistance Grant Fund, which was also something conceived here in the city of Portsmouth and advocated for. And we were successful in getting it into the Code of Virginia as well as getting it funded. It's turned out to be a fairly popular program. Uh, we first allocations was made this year, and I think the city received like over $400,000 to um, fix the generator at Churchland High School, I believe it was. And so what we found out, though, is that there are localities that do not own or operate their own, own their own shelters. They just operate. So what we're asking here is to go back into the code to amend it so that these localities um, who operate a shelter but don't own it can have access to this uh, fund as well, as well as to increase the fund to about $5 million annually. So then I'm not going to go through this whole list of uh, supported state and public policy initiatives. A lot of these are coming. Um, these are things that we have generally supported. They're also um, coming out of the Virginia Municipal Leagues package. They're coming from Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, Hampton Roads Transportation Organ Organization, Hampton Roads TAC, HR TAC, Transportation Accountability Committee, Hampton Roads Transit, et cetera. I will like to put, um, bring one to your attention, the fourth bullet down, the amending of that particular code dealing with historical African-American cemeteries. As you may recall, some of you who were on council about 2017 or so, we were the second city to receive funding for our African-American cemeteries uh, <clears throat> after the initial uh, legislation was passed the year before. The issue seems to have arisen and in Hampton and um, that there are some privately owned cemeteries that may have some African American historical significance with them and they do not have access to this fund. So there's a move underfoot between Hampton um, and um, I think Chesapeake may be helping out with this to try to get this section of the code amended so that these private cemeteries that are located, we found Virginia Beach said they have some, Norfolk said they have some, I think we may have one as well. So this would be something that would help that. So we're asking that, you know, they're going to come up with the language, we're just going to support it and advocate for it during a general assembly session if council dictates that we should. And this is just another page of support of state public initiative, policy initiatives. I'll draw your attention to the last one. This is something that's been um, bantered around for about a couple of years now at Virginia Municipal League. It's going to be in their legislative package. Um, the option here is for a local type of a piggyback income tax ta tax that's going to be opposed at the local level uh, for both general and special purposes. And one of the special purposes they're saying is for modernization or of our school systems is something that it could be used for. So, and then moving to the federal legislative initiatives, the recommendation here is for us to continue working alongside the National League of Cities. 
uh, for the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights um, Advancement Act, the passage of the Investment Act. We had, I had started on behalf of the city to advocate for and working with um, National League of Cities for the reinstatement of telework income tax credit. This is a credit that was in the federal tax code for years until under the Trump administration when the tax code was revised, it was removed. And under the pandemic, under the new, the new normal that we're living in, a lot of people are now working from home. So it's only fair that they should be able to get that tax credit for that. So that's something I think we should definitely advocate for. Also, there is a bill uh, on the way when moving through the House of the Congress right now to provide funding and construction for rehabilitation of public schools. So I think this is another one, a good one. And of course, we'll continue to monitor for potential passage of uh, the current earmark that we have in and looking for any other opportunities of funding or projects through Congress or the federal agencies. So the last page is the next steps, which is going to be guided by the dates. Um, we're looking at trying to get our packages adopted by resolution by October uh, the 26th. Of course, we're coming into an election day on the 2nd of November. After the election is over, we will know who has um, replaced Delegate Heretic and will be our next delegate. Uh, as you know, uh, City of Portsmouth only has, we have a very small delegation. We have three senators and we have two delegates. Um, we would need to be meeting with the pre-filing for state legislative initiatives begins about the week after that on the 15th of, of November. You see that they're ending pre-filing on the 29th. So it was a very short turnaround window as mentioned by the city manager earlier. We have in between that, we should be having a joint meeting with the Virginia uh, General Assembly delegation members, <coughs> excuse me, in order to show up sponsors for our, our pieces. And then in December, the government is going to, the governor is going to present his budget on the 16th. The last one, it says pre-filing deadline TBA is there because at the time of the writing of this, uh, it hadn't been announced yet. But what happens generally after we pre-file and everything is submitted, then once they draft the bills, they send them back to us to look at them to make sure that they're correct before it's actually submitted to the hopper. So the date on there now is uh, December 31st. And of course, in January, you have the second session of the 177th Congress beginning on the 3rd of January. And the 22, 2022 General Assembly session begins on the 12th. And this is the long session. So we'll be there for about eight weeks into March. And that is the end of the presentation. And I have any questions, comments? Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Yes, thank, thank you, Ms. Neal. <clears throat> I have a question on page seven. Yes, sir. Um, the third bullet point uh, that indicates K-12 education expands standards of quality, provide funding for non-SOQ support positions. Um, is it any particular reason why this is uh, included as a policy initiative and not as a um, legislative initiative? Thank you for that question, uh, Mayor Glover, uh, Councilman Whitaker. Um, this, uh, if you could recall, when the Virginia First Cities came to before you, I believe it was uh, in June or July, and uh, Mr. Regenball spoke about what the problem is with the non-support SOQ positions, and that the SOQ needed to be expanded in order to take the burden, the extra burden of funding off of localities. Mm -hmm. Um, so to your question, right now we haven't put it in as a request because it's a it's a policy position that's being pushed not only by us, but Virginia Municipal League as well. Um, well it's not saying that we couldn't try to ask for it. Yeah, well, but because funding of public education, that's not just a policy, that's by legislative act. And so what the reason I'm raising this is because, as you know, Portsmouth has a very high poverty rate and since 2008 with the recession and the cuts that the General Assembly did with support positions through their funding formula, yes, sir. it caused uh, cities like Portsmouth to lose millions of dollars from state support. 
since the recovery period uh, from 2008, the state has received significant revenue streams to the extent, I think it was just announced um, here recently about what, a $2 billion? Yes, sir. Okay. And so mm -hmm. during this time period where the state has had this increase, the basic needs uh, formula has not changed. Actually, we are losing money. And I think that that needs to be a strong legislative item um, that um, there needs to be a modification of the code to reflect the basic needs calculation. Number one, removing the support positions cap, which is what the legislature has done, um, removing the support positions cap. They put a cap on support positions, which has cost us millions of dollars. And the other is allocating both the lottery and the state treasury funds as part of the basic needs. What a lot of people don't realize is that what the General Assembly did was to uh, supplant the state treasury funds with lottery money. So it wasn't like the lottery was additional money, as people think. It, it took the place of something else, yes. which has also cost our district. And so I think we need to be very aggressive with that. Since we have both a Democratic House and Senate, <laughs> It looked like we should take advantage of that and get these things back in place and uh, democratic governor so that our children will not continue to suffer with being underfunded. We've tried to address it at the local level, but it's not enough at the local level. We need the money from the state that our school districts were receiving prior to the recession. And I think that needs to be a strong legislative uh, position that we present. Thank you, Councilman Whitaker. Your points are well taken. And if that's the, the consensus of council. If there's an objection from council. We I can move that say. over to a legislative position. Well, there's no objection. Okay, thank you. And um, Ms. Dear, if you need the language that. Please, sir, if you don't mind, if you would send that. Okay. That would be helpful. Thank you. Next, anything else? Councilwoman Lucas Burke. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. McNeil, for this presentation. On the same page with the school modernization uh, via a 1% local option tax, I mean, who bears the burden of the, that one? Is it a 1% on us or the state or? It would be a 1% local option sales tax. Okay. So we, we would increase our sales tax by one cent, I believe is how it works. And that extra money would be used to go towards school modernization. Um, I believe it's Gloucester right now that requested that some time ago and was given that permission. Okay. And so now other localities are looking at having the ability to have that option as well. Okay, all right. And then on the next page, page eight, about the, uh, the piggyback income tax, I guess all my questions are tax related, um, that it would be an opportunity for us to take the pressure off the real estate taxes, I mean, Yes. So we, I mean, we could So it's a lower. local income tax. So I'm originally from New York City. Don't hold it against me. No. Um, but <laughs> we have in New York City, you have a federal tax, you have a local tax, and you have a school tax. Okay. So the local tax is on your local income. It's your income. So it's based on your income. Okay. So it would be on the actual worker. On the actual worker. Not the real estate tax, actually. Correct. Okay, and then the last question. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I saw it under page nine, but um, I read somewhere recently where Richmond was doing a guaranteed income for low-income um, residents or uh, families. Uh, I don't know how we we get that. I think they uh, were looking at it through their ARPA fund, but is that something that we consider through this, or is it something we consider through our own policy? Uh, resolutions. Um, Mayor Glover, Councilwoman Lucas Burke, thank you for that question. Just to give you a little background on that, the guaranteed basic income is the idea that 
came out several years ago. And as a matter of fact, in Stockton, California, in conjunction with one of the universities out there, they actually did a pilot program where Stockton, California uh, gave a certain number of citizens that were selected at random, but within a certain demographic, an extra $500 a month to see how that would change or how they would spend it or whatever. That is also something that one of the gentlemen that was running for president um, during the last election, um, I forget his name, but he, uh, Andrew Yang, mm -hmm. he was also a, propon a proponent of this basic income. And a lot of it is also based on what they're doing in Alaska because, because of the oil spill in Alaska, if you are a resident of Alaska, you get a monthly check every month. So this is something Congress is trying to move towards with this child tax credit mm -hmm. that they're giving people now and they're trying to make it permanent so they're not really calling it a basic household income. Now, to back to your question, if this is something that the city wanted to initiate with some of the ARPA funds, I believe that you probably could. We would need to check that to make sure. But it's uh, definitely something new that's coming down the pike, and, and it's, uh, I think it's a good thing, personally. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor, sir. Yeah, the, well, the, the concept of guaranteed basic income, that well precedes the University of California study. Oh, that's the first time I heard of it, though. Okay. Well, Social Security, um, you know, that's okay. guaranteed basic income. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a concept that Dr. King was arguing for in the 60s. So um, well, thank you for that way correction. Behind, we're way behind. But on page seven, again, the um, one, two, three, four, fifth bullet, bullet point that you were speaking to uh, pertaining to uh, the African American cemeteries, <clears throat> that fund that um, is there with the modification that's being sought, would that provide additional funds or would the localities and the privately owned be competing for the same pot? Mayor Glover, Councilman Whitaker, I believe it would be the same pot. So that, that would... That because would be you're limited as exactly of what you can get. Now, the funds are used to, like, clean the cemeteries, replace headstones, things of that nature. Um, we have asked for other funding to what's going to help us, like, replace a lot of the headstones and stuff, and we've not gotten it yet. And I think it's because there's so many other localities in the Commonwealth of Virginia who have recognize that they also have historic African-American cemeteries that needed maintenance and cleaning. So the more and more people have been coming along. So the pot has not been increased to my knowledge. It would, it would seem like it would need to be with that request if you're gonna bring in um, additional persons, uh, parties to request the funds, then that would be taken from localities and um, then you start seeing really uh, the impact of non or underfunding on the locality mm. side and it's back to the same situation. Mm, that's a good point. Good point. What, what councils dictate now, this is not nothing that we are putting in our package as a legislative initiative, but we are something that we're saying that we should support. But it can be mentioned to Hampton, whoever, that they should include that in their initiative. Um, or, I'm just thinking out loud as we're talking, if we wanted to just put something in to ask to increase it to accompany what they're doing, we could do it that way too. It depends on which way you guys want to go with this. I, I would think we would want to increase it so that you would still have funds available for the localities and funds for those privately owned as well, if there's no objection from council. Is that the uh, director of a council? It, it looks like there, there's no objection. We can, we can proceed with that, sure. All right, thank you. I will make that modification as well. Um, one other thing, just to remind you guys, we still need to pare down our legislative package. So when we come back before you again with all of the changes and the modifications, we still need to bring it down to a level where um, we're not trying to put in too many bills, because they still have a limit. Legislators have a limit on how many bills they can put in. 
that's outside of their own packages, uh, their own legislative initiatives, and then they have a limit on that as well. So we'll have to prioritize when we come back again. So, Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor. So when you come back with the pair down, will you know then which items will be carried by which legislatures? No, we won't know that until we actually have our meeting with our delegation members in November. Okay. Ms. Neal, yes. thank you, and I have a question. So when I met with the delegation and I presented our position on the midtown and downtown tunnel tolls, yes, sir. page six, uh, the 2022 suggested state legislative and budget initiatives. Yes, sir. I, I met with um, the, the leadership at the HR Transportation Accountability Committee and, and we are all of the opinion, as well as the other regional leaders from all the cities, uh, that this issue of toll tunnel reduction or elimination is a regional issue and that everybody is pretty much on board with helping uh, not only the region, but specifically Portsmouth, who is adversely impacted. Excellent. So we have had that conversation and I did talk to the folks at HR TAC. So I would like to see this one absolutely in terms of our legislative initiative uh, included in the package if, if my colleagues in council uh, would agree with that. I, Dr. Whitaker, you I, have the floor, yeah, sir. I agree with you, Mayor. It's just, um, are we gonna have any specifics as to how this reduction or elimination is being proposed? I just, I'm to be honest with you, uh, Mayor Glover, Councilman Whitaker, I don't have any specifics. I do not know what it would take. I've, I've heard it was like $2 billion, $3 billion. Um, I know when um, Mayor Glover actually spoke before the Hampton Roads delegation about this matter, Senator Spruill commented that there would be no buyback of the contract, but they were going to definitely look at what could be done about reducing the tolls on a permanent basis. So what all that shakes out to be, I'm not sure. So and, I'm and, looking for direction on that personally. And, and to your point, so when we reconvene with HR TAC, which is the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission, there are certain strategies that were discussed. As an example, perhaps we could buy back the interest or something of that nature but it has to be something that will go through the delegation and we have to agree. But I just wanna make sure that we keep this matter in front um, and that we don't let it slip away. I think that we owe that to our citizens of Portsmouth uh, to get the best deal going forward. So, so we'll have to talk about the specifics. Thank you. With the organization. Thank you. So just curious, me, in the, in the discussion, has there been any uh, commentary on increasing the gas tax? There has been commentary on that, uh, but once again, um, that hasn't really gone as far as we would like it to go. So there's open discussion. We're looking at all the options on the table, and I'm expecting that perhaps in the next couple of weeks, we will have some type of response in terms of what we, we will want to do going forward. And we'll share that with council at that time. Thank you, I appreciate the directive. Council Member Moody, sir, you have the floor. You know, when HR TAC meets, I, I think our goal should be the total elimination of tolls. If you give them the choice of, of a significant reduction, the word significant uh, means different things to different people. People doling out the money, I got a feeling significant would be a lot less than what we would call significant. So I, I would like I would like to see HR TAC uh, go for the total elimination of tolls. And, and uh, you know, the fallback position should be a percentage uh, that we want to come away with, uh, whether it's 75%, but I think it needs to be something specific that we want, not, not just uh, either or proposition. That's, I, that's I my agree. opinion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor Glover, Councilman Moody. I thank you for your feedback, and I look forward to the directive from Council how you want to frame this moving forward. Are there any other questions? If not, 
I thank you very much. I appreciate your input and your support. And we'll be back before you. Uh, we'll make the modifications as soon as I receive the information from you guys. And I guess city manager will send it to you so that when I come before you again, it'll be in its final shape. Thank you, Ms. Neal. And thank you for the work you do at the state level. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys. Have a good evening. City Manager Jones. Uh, next, we have Deputy City Manager Mimi Terry. She will present the staff's recommendation for the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Uh, this presentation will outline the eligible uses, terms and conditions, and proposed recommendation. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to seek approval from council to move forward with the noted ARPA categories. Now, I, I will also note before she begins that we're continuously getting information on additional resources that are available. Uh, we want to make sure to note that this is just a recommendation. Um, we will be looking to fine tune this based on council's direction. And at that time, when we confirm up some of the other sources, then we can always use the second year to, to address whatever gaps we may have this year. But uh, one in particular was from CDBG funds. Uh, we just found out that we're going to be getting $1.8 million, um, but we need to read the requirements of that and determine how much of that is going to be available and what, what they are. So with that, Ms. I'll turn it over to. Mr. Mayor. Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor, sir. Um, just, just in the interest of time, can we, um, this consensus council, can we move forward to page seven of this piece? Because much of this we already heard from First Cities when they came and presented. Can we, I'm, I'm interested in getting to the city yes. manager's proposed recommendations. Um, Ms. Ms. Terry, are, are, are you comfortable with that? Or do you feel that there's some information we may need to be? On page five. Made to have reinforced. If we could start on page five because of the requirements, I just want to kind of mention, make mention, okay. if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if, if I may just add to that, you know, I know that a lot of times when we have heard this information, the eligible uses, I think that would be appropriate to share with those again. Because I know that it's been a while since we've covered this information again, and I would think that the eligible uses still need to be um, made, made public, and we need to be aware of what those are. I promise I'll be fast and get right to your point. Go ahead, man. Be read to us again. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Madam City Manager, City Administration, and Citizens. Um, I'm here to present the proposed budget for categories for the American Rescue Plan Act award that was awarded to the City of Portsmouth. Um, I am requesting your patience and allowing me the opportunity to first re-familiarize everyone to the purpose of the state and local recovery funds due to COVID-19. Uh, the purpose of the funds is the intent to support state and local governments through COVID-19 and the impacts of the community's residents and businesses. I would like to just let everyone know that we did get our first allocation on June, 20, June 4th, 2021 and $28.4 million. Our second allocation is expected to come by December 31st. The total projected funding is $56.8 million. Uh, the eligible uses for the funding is public health emergency. Uh, those are the responses and the impacts to uh, COVID-19. Financial <laughs> impact deals with the negative impacts, impacted communities provision of governments, general revenue loss, frontline pay, EPA infrastructure, which are your water projects and sewer projects, and broadband projects. Where I want to bring your attention is to the terms and conditions of the awards, the requirements that are expected for every locality to follow, the single audit reporting requirements for our compliance requirements, the Treasury Uniform Reporting Requirements, there are interim requirements, project and expenditure requirements, annual and performance requirements. 
one I've already done. Um, internal control reporting requirements. This speaks to Dr. Whitaker's mention of policies and procedures as a formal documentation for each recipient and organization receiving funding. Standard, written standard, uh, the written standards of conduct which contain formal mission values, principles, and professional standards, risk-based due diligence for repayment validations, risk-based compliance monitoring for ongoing validation, for metrics, measures, and outcomes, record maintenance and retention for financial and non-financial records that have to be kept for five years. The time frame for opera spending, again, March 3rd through starting March 3rd, 2021 and ending December 31st, 2024. All obligations must be incurred by December 31st, 2024 and must be expended by December 31st, 2026. Any unspended funds must be returned to the Treasury. City managers propose ARPA funding recommendations. Recommended funding, infrastructure, and these are the categories of recommended funding, and then we'll go into each category. So for infrastructure, uh, we're looking at 15.4 million, water and sewer projects, 11.7, public health and safety, 8.7, community, 6.5, homelessness, 6 million, broadband projects, 4.5, recreational projects, 56. We're looking at these categories broadly for budgeting purpose, and within each category will be subcategories to be identified as cre and created. We have bids, proposals, and policies that need to be created. The total amount of 56 million. Infrastructure projects, what we're looking at is the seawall replacement, operation building replacement, sidewalk replacement, citywide pothole street paving, uh, Frederick Operations Security Fencing, Prentice Place Neighborhood Improvements, Ebony Height Neighborhood Outfall Improvements. <coughs> Projected cost of 15.8 million. Water and sewer projects, we have the elevated tanks rehab. Uh, council has bought that before uh, for Victory and Churchland. Water and sewer pump station replacements, it's estimated about eight stations to be replaced. Public health and safety, installation of touchless fixtures, police vehicle replacement program, fire and rescue apparatus replacement, essential personnel frontline workers, total projected cost 8.7, community, supportive workforce development and training. That is focusing on Portsmouth citizens, local business initiative grants, we're looking at Portsmouth Small Business Initiatives with EDA, Minority Business Development Programs with EDA, Public Safety, that's the grass, is categorized under community for public safety as grassroots engagements, neighborhood outreach, safe communities, recreation. A lot of the partnerships are with the schools as well with that. Um, I just wanted to make a note, this is supposed to be 6.5 million. Homelessness, design and build of a homeless shelter, housing assistance for homelessness. Uh, at this present time, there has been a site identified for the homeless shelter that we want to uh, include. Broadband, municipal broadband ex expansion. This is for internet and expansion of services for 4.5 million. Recreational programs, before and after school programs, recreation initiatives with Portsmouth Public Schools, and student scholarship programs. Additional sources of funding. The city's goal is to leverage and maximize all funding sources through the use of ARPA funds. We have partnerships with Portsmouth Public Schools ARPA funding. They are on a reimbursement only. Uh, CDBG, Community Development Block Grants, Behavioral Health Care, 
grant and operating programs. They have dollars for mental health. We want to pull our funds together and be able to impact more people. Public safety crime prevention grants, we're looking at different aspects and avenues where we can reach and try to get additional funding for those. Uh, various grants through state and federal authorities. Council's recommendations. What I wanted to do is present a slide that identified some of the things that council has brought before us in the past and identified whether we could use those funds with ARPA or we've used those funds for, we have other avenues for those funds. Uh, water tower replacement, we've addressed that with ARPA. Turf field replacement, we're currently partner with, partnering with Portsmouth Public Schools. Expanding mental health, we're trying to maximize the dollars that behavioral health care already has. Tax relief for seniors, we're expanding and streamlining the current process because we currently have that program available. Tax relief for disabled veterans, that's a current program with the city. Rental and eviction assistance, that's a state program that you could go on our website and you can actually go into the Virginia website and get some assistance from evictions and as landlords and tenants. Before and after programs, we have ARPA dollars dedicated to a category as well as with Portsmouth Public Schools mm -hmm. to address that need. Grassroot community grants, we have that under community and for ARPA funds. In summary, the city manager's recommendations for infrastructure are the best projected cost until the design work has been completed for final determination of actual costs. An evaluation of all programs will be on a continuous basis relative to matrix, metrics, measures, and outcomes. The action or council's action. So we're looking at, we were considering the next council meeting for action, but what I wanted to bring to your attention here is council can approve and authorize the city manager to implement recommendations for use of ARPA funds. Council can authorize city manager to award community grants. Council's authorization to the city manager to execute infrastructure projects. So we don't have to wait until the 28th. We can make that a decision today. If council has some additional things that they would like to recommend, we could add those to the categories. But what we don't want to do is continue to drag this on. We have um, organizations that really need the assistance and we have some infrastructure projects that we are afraid that we're going to run out of time. That's my conclusion. Um, if anyone has any questions, suggestions, recommendations. Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the figures that fall under each category um, any particular reason why the different programs do not have any monetary values associated with them? For example, um, when you start out with infrastructure and it's um, 15.4 million, and then you list several projects. Right. Is it, you know, I mean, what? What drives my dollars? Yeah, how, how did you come okay. to these? I mean, how? The seawall replacement a certain amount, you know? Yes. So what we did was we reached out to all of the departments because they know the needs for those particular projects. They're not new projects. They've been projects that we've been trying to get pushed so but they, just didn't have the dollars. So they do have dollar figures. Estimates. To, so can, can council, well, will you provide those to council so that we can see that breakdown? Yeah. That, that's really... Um, yeah, and if you want me to go through a couple, I can. No, okay. I, 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 I'd rather you give us the okay. comprehensive breakdown of how this is planned yeah. to be allocated. And again, proposed because due to COVID, there have been some holdups, price increases, but we right. just wanted to give you our best figures. Yeah. And we wanted to put those in categories because if something comes in a little less or something comes in a little more, right. you have the fluctuation right. to be able to work with those dollars right. in those categories. Right. So, um, for example, too, on page 12, 
with 6.5 million allocated to community, okay? And so of that, what's going toward each of these different areas? Is there uh, an amount for local business initiative grants um, that you have in mind, public safety? Uh, so would like to see that before any directive can be given because it's really just very broad and general. Okay, and I can share with you what we have on that. Just for focus on uh, Portsmouth citizens, about 500,000. Well, like I was oh. saying, I'd oh. rather you just give us a, a thorough report with it so that, you know, we don't have to go through each one um, tonight, but okay. just just present it. Also, when, when you... Uh, Madam City Manager, uh, Dr. Whitaker, uh, pause for a second. Madam City Manager, you have a response? That's um, one of the reasons we initially said September the 28th, because we wanted to make sure that we had some of the final uh, resources that are available to us. But we will have, we can provide in a report back of itemization of all the line items that are presented in the spreadsheet based on our projections at this point. Right. For the um, Portsmouth for All Business Initiative and Minority Business Development, just curious, when, when we're talking about providing funding for small businesses, how, how is Portsmouth defining small business? Uh, small business, any business with less than 50 employees, um, and we have to really write the policy out for that, for that initiative. Yeah. And that's another thing, to make sure that we identify the policies when we went to terms. But minority, small businesses, uh, under 50, and I just, I don't want to spew out a okay. lot of information, but. Yeah, I, I, my concern, I just want to make sure that <clears throat> small businesses aren't being captured within the same definition the state is using, which encompasses about 99% of all businesses. Right. Yeah. And then my last point <clears throat> I want to make is um, we had requested, well, in, in the memo that was presented that mm -hmm. last week, direct payments to persons as part of this initiative, which other cities around the Commonwealth are doing. And I'm just curious why that was not included. Our Madam City Manager. One of the primary reasons that we did not include the direct payments was because we were looking at this from a sustainable manner. And it was our goal to ensure that we could provide stipends to those meeting the criteria that we set that would enable them to enroll in our workforce development program so then we could place them in some employment. Um, we knew that if we just give direct payments two years down the road, we're going to be right back into the situation when these funds run out. So it's our basis, it's my recommendation that we try to look at something sustainable. That is the, the direction of council to change that, but that is the, yeah. the premise that I was operating under is to find a sustainable type of program and not just give direct payments so for two years down we'd be right back in the same position. Well, <clears throat> well, the much of the research is showing that um, persons are hurting right now. And um, those payments aren't necessarily just, just like with the funds that are coming from the federal that persons have uh, received. It, it wasn't from a sustainability long-term perspective. It was to address some present current needs that people are facing. Um, the sustainability uh, will come with pushing towards living wages and, and paying salaries that people can support their families. But this was um, seen as a bailout. And I think that um, that's something that council needs to um, seriously uh, take into consideration that we look at direct payments being given to persons um, and some criteria uh, uh, for that instead of um, just ignoring that. I just, I did not ignore that. I just wanted to make 
it known that failure to understand that you were looking at a bailout because a bailout could be one time only funds. Yeah, well, when I say ignore, I mean it's it's not addressed. Understood. Here, that's what Under, I mean. But we had an alternative approach that we wanted to use, but I am at the will of council. So if council wants to go forward with direct payments, we will implement direct payments. Maybe. Well, <clears throat> well. <clears throat> The information that was sent last meeting, when you said that you're working at the will of council, um, that memo was submitted based on a consensus of council. So I don't know how you decided to um, unilaterally not address that. It was not a unilateral decision not to address it. I addressed it by giving direct payments, but also in addition to the direct payments, it required workforce development training. I, I don't see direct payments up here. You say you addressed it by It's through workforce. Payments. You would get the direct payment when you enroll in the, direct, in the workforce development training. But all those persons will not be a part of workforce development training. But that's, that is the idea to upskill yeah. or to ensure additional right. skills. That, that has been the same tactic and um, logic that has been used and we've hearing that now with welfare uh, requiring work. We know that that generally is a way of decreasing who receives those funds. And right. so, um, like I said, the consensus was already given it, with the information that was submitted and it wasn't addressed. It's, it's addressed. It's just not addressed directly. It's addressed with a caveat. Okay. So you say. Okay. Council Member Woodard, sir, you have the floor, and then you will come to you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you Mayor. Uh, I was just uh, inquiring about uh, the municipal broadband expansion. Um, I, I think from one, one of our previous meetings, we were uh, uh, having an idea of Put in this broadband in different locations, different neighborhoods. Um, I was trying to see was this uh, this this four mill that was uh, in your presentation. Is this to expand this actual project, or is this to um, carry the project out in general? Um, you know, I'm I'm just trying to get a, a clarification on that. This money is to connect to the Southside Network Authority. Basically, it we have the broadband around the city. In order for us to connect to the hub, which will enable us to provide internet service, we need to connect either through the Southside Authority or we need to um, submit pipe or, or fiber to Virginia Beach, which is where the hub is located. This would provide two access points so we would have redundancy. Okay. And I, and I got one more other question. Uh, the seawall, I was uh, looking at that as well. Um, in your infrastructure uh, projects, um, is I, I thought we was already um, applying for monies to um, to to actually uh, work on this particular issue. Um, is is this just um, a tagline, or, or, or what, what are we doing exactly with this seawall thing? I think James Wright was actually working on that, getting some grant money um, um, for this issue. So uh, where are we at with that? I'll start and then uh, provide a report back if my response does not address your question. We are looking for additional grant funds, but it's my understanding that this amount that's reflected here will enable us to complete what we're, the phase that we're trying to complete. I will provide an additional response to that um, in more detail to address your question. Okay. All right. Thank you. And if I may say, I just want to remind everybody that we're still going after grants. We're still going after additional funding sources. Um, when I look at when I did, when Dr. Whitaker mentioned guaranteed payments, I did quickly do some research on my phone and I noticed that some of their funding came from uh, private sources and other resources. So that would give us the ability to be able to tap in. I think what they did, they did a, a resilience infrastructure, they used Robinson's Foundation, they used the Mayor's Fund, it, which they got additional partnership with, with 500000 they had, uh, was funded by a $15 million gift from Twitter CFO, CEO. 
I just want to remind everybody, we're looking for additional funding. This is not the beginning and the end. This is to get us started. And anything that we can tap into that will allow us to relieve us of some of these funding sources and can get it from outside sources, we're going for it. Mayor Barnes, you have the floor, sir. I just wanted to say first, um, I agree with um, Councilman Whitaker regarding the direct payments. I don't believe we should have that stipulation as far as the workforce development. Um, as far as the grassroots community grants, the I, I want to make I want to see what the stipulations are around that because for me personally, um, I don't know how council feels about this. I would rather see Portsmouth organizations um, get and pro provided these funds, these grants. Um, so I, I would like to make not make it a broad thing because we have a lot of organizations in Portsmouth who are already doing the work. Um, like I mentioned, you have. Charles Pete Little Lee, Olive Branch, um, and then you have the other community groups, but the the, the, the different sports um, organizations and things. I would rather see them getting the funding that we're putting in this grant. So to that response, there are internal control requirements, and one of the things that we're going to do is put policies around it. The companies or the organizations we've met with that have all come to the table and said they are looking for the city to or to assist the city. Um, there has to be some reporting requirements because that's the reporting requirements on the city as well to respond back to the internal control requirements to the federal government. So when we put the policies together, we're not going to make it um, hard, but you're going to have to be able to qualify based on what the requirements are from the state. And so you're going to have to be an established business. You're going to have to have um, documentation. You're going to have to be in service. You're going to have to have a vision, a mission, a tax ID number if you're a nonprofit. So as long as you meet the, the requirements, they're going to be outlined. Then that won't be, I won't say it won't be an issue, because we're reaching out and meeting with organizations now. And on top of that, we're not just going to hand out money because they're going to have to go through metrics and measures to ensure that the outcomes of what council is looking to re to have for the city. So if you're in an organization and you're working with the city, what are your outcomes? What are we looking at? Every quarter, what's the reporting requirement? Because that's on us as well. Because what we w don't want to do is go to the federal government and have use the funds inappropriately because then we're on the hook for paying that money back. And the city is in no way, shape, or form in a position to be on the hook for that. Well, I understand what you're saying, but what I'm saying is, is that is there any stipulations to make sure that we require only do Portsmouth organizations and not? Yes, we, absolutely. So, um, so there are stipulations that we can't just only do Portsmouth organizations? That we're going to do. We can set it for just Portsmouth organization. I'll let allow city manager to speak. City to manager that. Jones. Yes, we we are setting that requirement that there are only Portsmouth organizations that the that are meet the criteria. Aside from all of the criteria that uh, Deputy City Manager Terry just mentioned, we have additional criteria, and one of them is being a Portsmouth. I I, I have one more yes. one more thing. Um, as as far as the. The recreation. Um, mm -hmm. When it came to, I believe it was on page. I know, as far as recreation, we had specifically just the field replacement partnership with the Portsmouth Public Schools. Mm -hmm. um, is any of this any of the improvements to the facilities that we um, learned in the last meeting being um, addressed in these ARP funds, opera funds? I mean, because we had, I know we had some major concerns when it came to some of our facilities, Cavalier Minor Rec Center, um, the Charles so, Pete Field, you want to um, to some you. of those things. So one of the things that we wanted to do, and I put it in my notes, but I'm sorry I didn't speak to it. Um, we want to work with some private organizations. What city manager and I did is we drove around and we looked at the different facilities. We looked at Charles Pete. We looked at 
Cavalier Manor Gym. We looked at several facilities in Portsmouth. And so we drove down Portsmouth, Bullet, Portsmouth Boulevard and saw the YMCA Boys and Girls Club. Uh, and we have an idea or some things that we want to put together to look at a, a facility that is comparable to the Boys and Girls Club or um, is that is is it the Boys and Girls Club? It is Why in Portsmouth Boulevard. Right. The, yeah, they yes. remodeled and did it, and we are looking at a site. So I don't want to put so much on the table, but these are the things that uh, Madam City Manager will come back to you on to get to bring it to Council's attention for some things she wants to move forward with. So bef before we approve these funds, I, I would like to see what that looks like because I don't want us to move forward without addressing, of course, if that is the consensus of council, but I, I don't want to move forward without us addressing some of the serious issues that we have in our facilities when it comes to our rec facilities, our fields, and things of that nature, because if we seriously want to address some of the issues that we have in our city um, when it comes to our children and some of the crime that's happening, I think we really need to take a serious look and a serious um, uh, addressing of those issues before we do anything else. Madam City Manager, you have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, to your point about the additional recreation facilities, one of the primary reasons that we're working with Portsmouth Public Schools is they have more flexibility as it relates to youth programs and facilities. I do not, and based on the research that we've done, our recreation facilities do not meet the criteria for ARPA funds. The funds specifically say infrastructure related to water and sewer or public utilities and broadband. We're looking at some other avenues to see if we can make that, um, come up with a criteria right. creatively to try to meet um, those guidelines. But as of yet, we have not. That's why we are prioritizing with schools to get as many of those improvements done as we possibly can because they have more flexibility in their funding. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let, oh, hold your question. We're going to go to Councilwoman Lucas Burke. Uh, okay, go ahead and finish. Go, go, go ahead and finish. So, um, two things. Um, the, the, the rec centers, are they not considered public facilities um, and also as far as we'll go ahead I'll let you finish that they, they are but I was going to go back to the criteria page well why are you looking for that um, no, it's and page four okay and there's there's what we're trying to what we're trying to fund um, the recreation centers uh, to the extent that we can categorize them under impacted communities then we will be looking at that um, but right now we're trying to figure out how we can make those meet the criteria and right now they don't. Well, I think we need to make a, a honest effort and an honest yeah. try to make that happen because the problem with l using the school facilities is that they have programs. So even though, like for instance, Crydock has, they have basketball, they have foot, middle school football and all the things around that. So with that being said, I know that's a major facility that we are thinking about using Right. or even using some of the schools out Cavalier Minor to substitute for the Cavalier Minor facility. Yeah. You have the same thing at Waters or the other surrounding right. schools. So what that does is put us in a, a burden because we can't use those facilities no. at that time. And they're also closed at certain times. Yeah, that, let yeah. me be clear. What we're doing is trying to maximize the use of the school's uh, funds because they're on a reimbursement basis and we're fronting the resources for that. But the idea is when we get those funds back, we have the flexibility to use them on any projects we have. And that would be the, the goal is to create those funds that we could use for any of our priorities. So that's, that's the approach that we're trying to take because that $46 million has to be spent on maintenance. It, it can be spent on some youth-related programs. Uh, we're working through that with schools. Uh, to the extent that we can nail that down, then those funds would then be available for our other high-priority items. Because we've gotten some of the things that we're already planning to do with schools addressed through 
the $46 million, and therefore we have the funds to do what we need to do. I, I'll um, qu have more questions later. I'll let you go. Yes, thank you. Um, Councilwoman Lucas Park. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Manager Terry, for the presentation. I can appreciate you presenting to council to inform us, but uh, we also know that our citizens want to uh, be informed as well, and the transparency is really appreciated in this um, effort. You taking the additional time to go through all of these uh, matters. Uh, w one of the questions that I have is under the uh, infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. and I know that we have CBDG funds and also our capital improvement funds. So the 15.4 million dollars that's um, projected cost for the items that are listed here, does this? go in hand with our CBDG funds and our capital improvement funds that we have already allocated in budget, or does this uh, wipe those out? We can put that to the side. So How, for uh, my apologies. No. Uh, mm -hmm. So for capital improvements, those projects are already on the table. We've already started spending. Remember, we even had to go through to get bond money to right. fund those projects. Exactly. And so those were already in the works, so we're already done with those. but not done, but not done. we have allocated dollars for those. These are pretty much new projects that without this funding, we would have to go, we would have to pay as you go or get the money from the city. And so with this one-time opportunity, we saw this as an opportunity to get these projects done without having to go out for bond money and adding more debt to the city. That's my question. Okay, and then the Prentice Park in Ebony Heights, how? Uh, were those neighborhoods um, selected, and are there any others that could be considered for um, the infrastructure projects? Yes, those neighborhoods were uh, selected based on the assessment study that was done that okay. showed where we were having issues okay. uh, within the city. Are there others? Yes. Right. And will this address all of them? No. Yeah. Uh, but we try to at least um, use the funds to address the infrastructure needs because we know that uh, we want to create some kind of pay-as-you-go without having to go and issue bonds. Right. Great, like that. And on the next page under the water and the sewer uh, projects, I see uh, for the elevated tanks is something we've been talking about, the rusty tanks I drove by yesterday and saw that. So is that going to include removing and replacing it with some other type of development there, or is it just the removal with the $11.7 million? That's think that's the repair because oh. yeah so it costs a lot of money <laughs> to, to do that down. and it, what it was brought to council is to repair to uh, clean them up um, and so that's what those dollars were allocated for and I think the last what we saw was what your mama said uh, about 2.5 million dollars to repair to repair okay. those two tanks because we have antennas on the top I think they did some type of study to look what was underground to take a determination whether we want to go up or stay up or go underground and it was not the recommendation to remove those and go below ground it was the recommendation to keep them Just up repair. and clean them up okay the, yeah and then the next question under community um, the, I've gotten a lot of calls from citizens in the community specifically the Newport community and the Cavalier Manor community that are needing uh, neighborhood watch vehicles or some kind of neighborhood watch program I know that that's something that we had in the past where civic leagues would take turns or they could do a combined effort and have somebody patrolling the neighborhoods to try to look out for uh, some of the crime and I know our city attorney gave us a report on the curfews you know if they are seeing things you know that's something that the community watch I don't know if that includes safe communities or neighborhood outreach that goes to the safe communities, the neighborhood outreach programs, and the grassroots engagement that we're doing. And also we're partnering with the sheriff because he is also a part of that team where we're working together with organizations to do some, some crime prevention, some visibility. Um, we're talking to organizations that are going out that are already in the neighborhood invisible and working with the students and the schools and ensuring that these things can uh, help and prevent crime by bringing them in, having someone visible and available, 
and even targeting the t the kids who are in the street. We heard some amazing stories by some grassroots organizations who have been meeting with us during this time, mm -hmm. um, and they have given amazing stories. And to be to know that this is a possibility, and putting kids on the right road right. and getting them jobs, working with development programs, uh, identifying some behavioral health issues, right. mental health. I mean, I think that moving forward to put this in action would be a benefit for us Everybody. across the board. Okay. And my last question under the homelessness, uh, the design and build out the homeless shelter, is this going to be a city man controlled program are we partnering with our uh, Portsmouth volunteers for the help and our park uh, groups that are already doing things uh, to provide shelter and housing and assistance for homelessness yes and what i will say we are working with uh, the community development block grant we are working with the homeless initiatives and the homeless shelter that we currently have here in Portsmouth um, Everything we do based on this plan is a partnership because, again, we are looking for people who are saying we need to get this done but are willing to assist in getting it done. And it's such a wonderful partnership. I have never seen the community pull together like they have now because now we have a source of funding to be able to assist them in identifying those issues that are out in the community and bringing them to the table. So with the partnerships we have, it's not a, just a one-time shot. I'm hoping, and my hope is, to get these initiatives started and they continue even after the funding may not be there, but we'll find sustainable and identify means to continue and provide resources for these organizations to continue. Okay. Thank you. I yield my time to my colleagues who have other questions. Thank you. <laughs> Councilman Battle, sir, you have the floor. Well, first of all, I'll say that uh, all of the programs make sense. Uh, it makes sense uh, to uh, put money aside for those who want to uh, try to pull themselves up, and it makes sense to make the direct payments. So what council is trying to say, in essence, is the impact of these funds, they want it to be felt across the communities equitably. They don't want to error with this because we are accountable and that's what means foremost to us. Now are the other projects needed? Yes they are. But the council is basically saying the people first. We want to be able to show them we want for them to be able to go through the books and see that we've tried to do this as best we can with an impact immediate situation. Therefore, we're going to have to get some workshops together and put together exactly how much we're going to do for those programs and exactly what makes sense uh, for the total situation. So this is what the council is saying. And you've made your presentation, but the consensus of the council is saying people first. And they want to make those payments to the people, to the organizations, first and foremost and then the other items. But again, we're going to have to have workshops to put this together. The council is saying we want to be micromanagingly involved. And that's what the essence of uh, everything that's been said is. Thank you. Ms. Terry, um, I want to say, first of all, that 
I want to thank you and the city manager and all the city staff for this comprehensive program that you've put together. I think it was well thought out and it was appropriate and the recommendations I certainly agree with. One of the things I did want to add is that in this process um, that we're dealing with, um, we have sought out and looked at other models in terms of community engagement and involvement. So much so, um, I reached out to my friend, LeVar Stoney, Mayor LeVar Stoney in Richmond, and the city manager and I visited Richmond. And the purpose of that visit was to see what they were doing to impact the community first and some of the programs that they had put in place. They have several programs, but I was impressed by the fact that similar to what you all have recommended, um, they have a program where they're building up people and providing skill sets and other opportunities so that they can obtain those living wage jobs in addition to paying them while they participate in those programs. And you know, I was always taught as a kid, you know, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach him to fish, you feed him or her for a lifetime. So I just want to reiterate um, to everybody on council and to the citizens of Portsmouth, we are committed to helping those citizens who are in need and we are working very earnestly uh, to provide those opportunities for people not to just grow through this pandemic and this situation, but put them in a position where they can truly thrive and be positive, productive, contributing members to their and our community. So I applaud you on your efforts, ma'am. Um, I think this is a good schematic, a good outline, a good start. But um, that's not how we want to work it right now. Um, the consensus, again, at the council, you know, wants to have an impact situation on the pop populace through direct payments and um, feed the fish being able, the, the, the individual being able to fish for themselves. But let me say this in all due respect to the mayor and anybody that says, oh, well, I looked at the program in New York and I looked at the program in Philadelphia. To see what they're doing. Are we matured and adults enough to look at the program in Portsmouth and, and, and put programs together for ourselves. I, I don't care, I wish Norfolk well, but we have to develop these programs because we're the ones who scan in the game and know what's happening. Richmond is an entirely different city. Norfolk's an entirely different city. And every time we waste our time saying, oh, well, Norfolk got this, she got this, and this. It, it takes away from our problems. We have to look at them. We have to come up with the solutions and stop taking the shortcut to think that that's gonna do it. Richmond can't do it. Portsmouth has to do it. Richmond's ideas very well may not work here. We know what our problems are. It takes us to solve them. And again, people first is what they're trying to do, and, and they're not going to have it any other way. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. sir. Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Yeah, the, um, the, the saying that you just quoted, give a man a fish, live for a day, teach him, live for a lifetime, um, that saying has not withstood uh, the criticism of history. Um, the Western expansion of this country, um, we saw land being given to people. We saw land grant universities created to teach them and then 4-H uh, programs to train them. Um, so this whole context that I'm hearing this discussion about there's some handout, um, I, I think we're positing this in a light that uh, is not accurate. Um, when you mentioned, Ms. Terry, about 
the organizations having to meet certain criteria? Is there training that's going to be provided for those organizations to assist them in that process? Uh, because um, there has been some of the opinion that you're supposed to come to the table already with those things. However, we know that there have been organizations within this city that have received funding um, contracts have been issued to companies that did not even have the equipment to do the work. And so if we're going to do that, then do, are we having the training in place? Um, and, and I say that very seriously um, because this city funded the Cock Allen boat race for years, and there was no scrutiny of that. And there were hundreds of thousands of dollars that were issued to these boat owners to have drinking parties and races on the city's dollar. And so I don't want to try to cast when persons are coming uh, who have not been part heretofore of this process as if they're just looking for some handout that we're giving. But there is legitimacy to what uh, these organizations have presented, and I think we should try to help them as much as possible to assist us in addressing a serious issue here in the city. Now, my, my other issue I want to raise is on page 17. Okay. <clears throat> and on, on page 17 where you list the uh, council recommendations uh, and you have the different sources of funding, um, there are only three programs that involve uh, ARPA funds. The other programs where, and, and we mentioned this at the August 10th meeting, uh, for example, when, when you have up here tax relief for seniors, expand and streamline the current process. If I'm reading this correctly, that means there's no federal funds involved in this, no ARPA funds involved. Right, because we already provide funding for that. Right, so with that funding, there are stipulations that those persons have to meet in order to get, for example, that senior tax relief, mm -hmm. okay? There are some that will not meet that criteria. And okay, no, I'm just saying, okay. there are some that we know will not meet the criteria. Correct. So would that be where ARPA funds would come in to expand so that persons who do need tax relief assistance can get it? I'm, I'm curious, is, is that the mindset or is it just that we're going to purely look at what we have and keep, keep doing that? So what I, I just want to remind, council sets that determination for uh, senior taxes and uh, right. veterans. So at any point, at any time, council can say we can open up the process for the seniors that we already have in the, uh, in the city of Portsmouth. Right. And so if we want to look at that program and streamline it and be able to expand it upon more people being uh, advanced to the program, that's council can right. make that so, determination. So, so the issue I'm raising then, ARPA funds can be used in this program. It can. Right. It can be. Um, is it sustainable? I'm not, because at some point after the two year period is over, the city will still have. Once, once again, the issue of sustainability is not the basis of these federal funds that we are seeing. It's to help people in their present conditions and situations. Um, so if funds can be used to help to provide some relief in the short run for citizens on their taxes, that's putting dollars in their pockets, the same as direct payments. And so when we say we already have these programs, we know we have them, but they have criteria attached to them that we can expand through ARP and also through our policies, but also we would expand the basket to include more funding for citizens if that's something that can be done. Right, and so, so a policy would still have to be put in place for those. Right. If, if it's council's desire to okay. expand that and use our ARPA funding, mm 
Mm -hmm. That's we have the broad community. Okay. So those things is are the sub awards. Those are the sub components. So we had the categories. And so, okay. like I said, we wanted to be able to get the approval of the categories, but the subcategories is what council can come back and say, this is what I want you to add to community. This is what I want you to add. As long as the funding is saying, I'm going to, we're going to dedicate $6 million or $6.5 million to community. But out of that $6.5 million in community, I want you to ensure that this amount goes to a subcategory for senior taxes. This amount goes goes for a subcategory here. Um, that's council's desire. But what we wanted to do is just put the categories before you. Again, right. I identified the programs that we already have. So if it's the desire of council to expand the programs that the city already has for seniors, that the city already has, because whatever you do, you're going to have to still follow a policy. And so if we're expanding that, what does that look like? What are you? What is the expectation? Do you have to be at a certain age group? Do you have to make a minimum income? All of those things still have to come with criteria. Well, I believe that <clears throat> I, I believe that's why we have a day-to-day -day staff. That's not for council to come up with that. And so, what what I'm saying is that we have programs in place. We have funds coming into the city where we can expand it to help our citizens in these times. And if we can do that through tax relief, direct payments, if there's no objection from council, then I would like to see that presented to us at our next meeting, showing how these funds can be used to offset what citizens are facing today. And so um, if there's no objection from council, I would like to see these programs in which you're saying we already are doing mm -hmm. that they can be expanded to include more of our citizens that may not have to be just limited to seniors you you deal with the figures every day so you know what can and, and, and what's possible I'm not trying to sit here tonight and suggest that council is going to come up with that because that's what we would get as a recommendation once we have directed the city manager in a certain direction. Okay. And then in the last, I just want to make sure, on the report back, um, applying the cost to each of the items and also the direct payments and the real estate tax relief that we just discussed. Thank you, sir. Ms. Terry, thank you. You're welcome. City Manager. To, uh, I wanted to bring to your attention, we have 15 resolutions um, on tonight's agenda. Uh, they are to accept grant funds. Uh, the other item on the City Manager's report um, is looking at uh, removing a potential loophole in the derelict structures program uh, by requiring structures to be secured rather than boarded up. Uh, this is one of the city's main tools to prevent an increase of blighted structures in the neighborhoods. Uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on the grants because you'll get them individually, but I did want to see if there were any questions about the city manager's report at this time. Go ahead. Yes. Councilwoman Lisa Lucas Burke. Thank you, uh, Manager Jones. I did have one question about the grants that are coming through the police department. I noticed that most of the grants that were received had to have a city match where uh, prior budgeted fuel and maintenance costs um, are already uh, included as part of the match. So that's that, that, that's correct. How we do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. We do have a need for a closed session. And so, um, Dr. Whitaker, would you please read the motion? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm willing to um, forego that discussion if council is of a consensus that they want to move forward with 
the process that is already before us, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, so you, 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 the question before us is, are you not gonna read the motion or are you willing to forego the motion? Well, I was, if I was saying if, if council doesn't feel we need to discuss it. Well, we have a motion to discuss you know, the, the city attorney position okay. to go into close. So would you okay. please, would okay. someone please, 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 please read the motion. I move to go into a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code's subsection 2.2-3711A1 for the purpose of discussion, consideration, or interviews regarding the performance and position of the city attorney. Second. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Barnes. Yes. Mr. Battle. Yes. Mrs. Lucasberg. Yes. Mr. Moody. Yes. Dr. Whitaker. Yes. Mr. Woodard. Yes. Mayor Glover. Yes. We are now in closed session. We need a motion to certify a closed meeting. I hereby move that each council member certify that to the best of his or her knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only such public business matters that were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened, were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting just concluded. Second. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Barnes. Yes. Mr. Battle. Yes. Mrs. Lucasburg. Yes. Mr. Moody. Yes. Dr. Whitaker. Yes. Mr. Woodard. Yes. Mayor Glover. Yes. We'll take a three-minute break, and then we will come back to convene the meeting. 